Well, let's look at the flood. And uh, one of the truths is that the ark is a beautiful picture of salvation offered in Jesus. You know, the ark was big enough to hold all the animals that God wanted to satisfy or to save, as well as all the people. And God could have saved everyone that wanted to be saved. But what's interesting is only eight people wanted to be saved. And what a sad thing it is. It says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's nature does not change. His will in Peter's time is the same as in Noah's time. Those who perished in the flood were only those who rejected God's way of salvation. And the only people that are going to perish in the tribulation hour Christlessly are going to be those that reject. See, God is going to pour out, he's going to send the tribulation witnesses, 144,000 that will be converted Jews that will come to Christ and then become his, his invulnerable witnesses on the planet. The two witnesses are going to crisscross the planet and have miraculous powers. And in the end, when the two witnesses and the 144,000 are gone, God's going to send an angel to proclaim the everlasting gospel around the globe. And you know what people are going to do? It says in Revelation 16, it says they're going to worship their gods of stone, they're going to worship the demons, and they're going to in, just immerse themselves in their wickedness. You see, they don't want to hear the truth but I'm so glad that we do. Well, let's consider the flood historically. Number one, the fact of the flood is proved by the Genesis record. Now, just because there's scientific evidence of the flood on every square inch of this planet, just because there's no way to explain the geological structure of the earth apart from water being involved in a great way, unless you totally deny that and and contort these, these ridiculous scenarios to make it happen, but if you, don't, if you just look as a normal person with a reasoning eye, there's no way to explain the geology of this planet without a lot of water being involved. But that's not why I believe in the flood. And I was talking with someone after the morning service. The fact of the flood is proven by the scriptures, not by science. It's not empirical. It's not observable. It's not scientifically provable or, or discernible things that make me believe in the flood. And you can't prove to a skeptic or an unbeliever the flood other than by telling them that the Word of God says it. And God says if anyone's willing to know his will, he'll know it. But you have to be willing. There has to be that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't come to God without faith. And so I want to remind you that all these things that I tell you, if you have some unsaved or skeptical or agnostic or or whatever friend, and, and you say, let me give them all the facts, you know what? They will still be a skeptical, agnostic, unbelieving friend with all the facts, without the intervention of faith and without God intervening supernaturally in their life, because it's not facts, it's the truth that is believed. Well, Christ taught about the literal flood, I already read that to you, and you can write that down in Matthew 24, 37 to 39. Another reference to put by Christ believed in the flood is Luke 17, 26. This is what Jesus said when he was preaching. Luke 17 and verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. You see, he didn't, he didn't even try and prove Noah, he said Noah existed. Noah's era existed. The, the wickedness of the world existed. And the wrath of God was, was dumped upon the world at that time. He didn't have to prove it. He believed it. The prophet Isaiah says this. And let me read to you Isaiah 54 and verse 9. It's interesting how all the writers of Scripture uh, agree uh, in, in their emphasis upon the flood. It says in Isaiah 54 and verse 9, For this is like the waters of Noah to me saith the Lord. Isaiah is recording God talking, the infinite God who is truthful and makes no error. And God said, for this is like the waters of Noah to me, for I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, not the delta of the Tigris and Euphrates, not the fertile crescent, the entire planet. You say, wait a minute, how could the waters, in fact, I've heard all kinds of you know, interesting stories like how could all those animals exist at 35,000 feet if the waters were higher than the tallest mountain, as in you know, Everest or if there was a taller one back then? Well, let me ask you this. Can a boat that's on a global ocean ever be higher than sea level? It wasn't at 36,000 feet. It was at sea level. It was everything else was undersea. You know, the tallest mountain in the world is actually Mauna Loa. If you know anything about Hawaii, it starts two miles back at the bottom seafloor and goes another few miles above the sea. But if the whole thing's covered with water, then the top of Mauna Loa is sea level if there's a flood. Uh, lots of other stuff like that. And, and the Bible, though, explains that. It says in Psalm 104 that after the flood, God raised the mountains. 
There were not mountains as we know it right now. That's why the geologists have so much trouble. They can't explain some of the overthrust where there are sedimentary layers and, and then Cambrian rock and all this stuff, and they can't figure it out. And part of it is because after the flood, Psalm 104 says, God thrust up the mountain. 